podcast for Chapter 10 in Field Methods Hydrology on the topic of stream assessment. Now this is a course in hydrology and I started off this course by talking about the water balance and its centrality to understanding everything related to hydrology. But at the same time, throughout the course, we're going to be going much broader than just the specifics of water fluxes and looking at the driving landscape variables or other properties of the landscape or water quality that might be related to the water balance or in association with it. So this is the first you know, of a, of a fairly sizable uh, presentation that addresses one of those topics. And this is the topic of stream assessment because we've just done velocity and discharge and we're having a field trip or you may have just had a field trip associated with this unit. Now stream assessment and watershed assessment are both broad topics for which there are many different methods and specifics of how to go about it. This presentation is going to focus on physical aspects of the river, not vegetation and not biology, you know, macroinvertebrate indices and things like that. <clears throat> Another thing is that many government agencies have developed a variety of protocols, procedures, assessment frameworks, I mean, whatever you want to call them, but a variety of ways of doing stream assessment. And I'm not going to work through a particular one or hit on all aspects that one might want to do depending on the situation. What I want to do is just kind of dissect what are the fundamental elements of a river corridor starting at the watershed scale and zooming in down to like, you know, the meter scale. <clears throat> and just try to be uh, provide you with an introduction and awareness of how you'd go about some of the basic elements that you'd want to do. Of course, if you're going to do stream assessment or watershed assessment for a particular employer or in a particular region, you're going to need to go well beyond just what this introduction presents. But I think what you will find is that if you work doing stream assessments, um, all of the elements that are here are definitely things to consider. And, you know, as a go-to place, you know, the topics that are covered here, you should definitely be prepared to address whenever you do uh, a report. And in fact, this is commonly things that I see or that I do in such reports. And the information here is usually in like a master's thesis or PhD characterizing a site or river watershed um, as part of that scientific research. Well, it's definitely the case that people have dramatically altered the structure and function of rivers throughout history, but most especially in the modern era, thanks to modern machinery. And we've seen a scale and intensity of change that is just simply unprecedented. I mean, humans have the ability to alter the earth at the scale of the whole earth. Just as one example of that is the case of mountaintop mining such as occurs in West Virginia in the United States. In this mining approach, they don't just like dig a shaft and go in and then <clears throat> get the, the coal out of the seams, but they actually take off the entire top of the mountain and then fill in the valleys below. Mountaintop mining has been a fairly controversial um, approach to mining and uh, it's just an example of why we need to be able to assess streams and figure out whether practices like this are causing problems. Here in California, we had the example of, of, of the gold mining history that's taken place. And at times, there have been moratoriums on mining. And so, again, you know, is that warranted on the basis of the science and what's going on in the streams? Well, the only way to get to that is to create a baseline by going out and seeing what conditions are like, preferably before those problems um, start, and then tracking them through time to see how conditions change. <clears throat> An important aspect of stream assessment is it's often done in a hierarchical framework. Now from the experimental design and sampling presentation that I gave, um, I did refer to this, so you may want to look back on your notes on that, but there are different spatial scales at which things are happening, and you you always want to present something about all the scales, um, at least the scales that are bigger than the scale at which you're working on, if not ones that are smaller. Streams are ordered systems. There are aspects that are um, you know recurring across different spatial scales, and there are unique aspects. 
It's important to understand that the main things that are moving through watershed are of course water and sediment and then a whole bunch of chemical and biological constituents associated with those. But fundamentally, coming off the land, there are factors that are controlling the production of water and sediment in terms of topography, soils, vegetation, geology, lithology, even tectonic uplift, and climate factors. All of those things are going to produce the water and sediment that are going to be shaping a river corridor, and then in also working in conjunction with the local topography, local vegetation, local geology, and so on to help condition what you see. There's an approach to thinking about this hierarchical framework that's called the River Styles Framework, and it comes out of Australia, and I think it's a very nice way of organizing, even though it's not the only hierarchical one. But it lists the catchment scale, landscape scale, river style scale, geomorphic unit, and hydraulic unit. And I'm going to be working through these to show um, you know, what's involved at these different scales. Now river style, that's the main term you probably haven't heard before. It would be similar to reach scale, possibly even segment scale, um, where, uh, if, of course, if you haven't heard those terms, it doesn't really help you, does it? So I've just defined one thing with something else you don't really know. But um, no, I mean, you know, reach is a very common term, and it usually means, yeah, like what it says here, a length of channel which has a characteristic assemblage of features or landforms within it. Um, and so that's the river style. Now remember, I also talked about the styles of a hydrological function. And so here we're talking about a landform style that's analogous to the hydrograph style. I mean, style just refers to what is the spatial or temporal behavior of something. And so we use the term style for that. Uh, I guess that's our way of being original. I don't know. Okay, so first at the catchment and landscape scales. You know, catchment is like watershed or basin. Um, it's the largest scale that we're typically interested as, you know, for watershed-based science, of course. And um, typically, we're interested in what are the landscape units that are going to be present there that could be hill slopes, um, mountains, lowlands, you know, floodplains, the river quarter, um, remember when we were looking at topographic delineation, there are the hill slope noses where water is diverging off of that. There's the hollows where it's converging. And there are basically the processes of water and sediment generation that are taking place at these scales. There's also the relief that's represented in the mountain range that's taking that, that a watershed is, is occurring within. And um, that relief, which is the difference between high points and low points, um, is an indicator of how well dissected the landscape is by channels, which tells you something about how efficiently the system can evacuate sediment out of, of a watershed. So the first thing that you'll see in almost any report about something about hydrology in the real world is a general description of the study area which in this case could be the catchment. And so at the catchment scale, saying something about the climate of the system, like what are the temperatures and precipitations, how are they distributed throughout the year, are there typical kinds of events or disturbances that take place, and are there key historical ones of those that have happened that are particularly notable. That'd be a pretty basic description of the climate um, that you would need to know. You also might want to throw in evapotranspiration because that's also a common factor in, in climate classification. The next is valley type. And I'll be showing you what I mean by that, but it has to do with um, uh, a fairly complicated idea, but the idea that the shape of the land across a region tends to be in relation to the balance between tectonic uplift of the land and the ability of climate to cut down through it. When things are changing very fast, then you tend to produce um, very high, highly dissected landscapes with very high rates of sedimentation, where you have a, you know, you might have a lot of slope-driven processes and, and, and things taking place. So high rate of uplift has to be offset uh, 
by a high rate of downcutting, and that tends to require a lot of landslides and other mass movements. On the other hand, if something is moving very slowly and has a lot of geological resistance in terms of you know, its slow uplift rates, then that tends to be offset by very gentle climate um, processes. Even if the, if the climate is much more aggressive than the tectonic rate up calls for, you end up with just simply very gentle landscape landforms. So I'm hitting on some essential ideas in geology about how geology and climate interact that are not really essential to what we're talking about, but give you a sense of the context of, of what's going on. And if you want to understand that in more detail, I offer a class in Hillslope Geomorphology and Sediment Budgets at the graduate level that covers that. So the valley type tends to reflect those underlying geologic and climatic driven factors, and it creates a variety of valley types that we'll see, which in turn affect stream condition. The next one is something that is really, really important in, our, in, in river science, but is often not emphasized enough, and it's the degree of bedrock control. When you look at a river, what is the, is it sediment or is it rock? And I don't, when I say rock, I don't mean like boulders and cobbles, I mean bedrock, you know, <laughs> or potentially concrete, or even a mud hard pan. Um, you know, highly cohesive mud essentially behaves like a bedrock. Um, the, the, the ability to assess the stream and the way you think about it or compute things is totally different if it's a bedrock river or like that versus if it's an alluvial river. And most of the science we have relates to alluvial rivers and is often misapplied in bedrock settings. And that's why it's important to know the degree of bedrock control. Lastly is the flow regime. And this is going to relate to climatic or you know, weather-based drivers, but rather than studying precipitation and other weather data, we often just look at the, the discharge regime as presented in the runoff. Um, so there's a stream gauging station somewhere in the system or a nearby watershed, and that's what we use. And in HYD 143, I have a whole presentation about the natural flow regime, and you don't have to go look at that now, but if you want to know more, you can. Um, but, you know, typically we want to know not only about the magnitude of flow, but the frequency of a given event, the timing, duration, and the rate of change of flow. Um, so all of these factors come together to define the overall flow regime that a river experiences, and they represent part of the general catchment description that you should have as part of any um, characterization of a stream. And now I feel like I'm starting to get back to the historical analysis and all that kind of stuff. So, Okay, so valley types. Um, this is a typology that comes from David Rosgen in a 1996 textbook. Um, and I think it's pretty good. I mean, of course, it's not so important, type 1, type 2, whatever. But just getting the idea of the kinds of valleys that are out there. Ooh, that's not good. See, this is why I turn off my Wi-Fi and say, don't bother me. Sorry about that. Okay. All right. Uh, anyway, so we have these different valley typologies that are there, and it helps us to appreciate what kind of processes might be happening. So the first three shown here, type 1 through 3, um, are generally steep and you know, would be associated with fairly well-dissected landscapes. So type 1, <clears throat> we can see here, is scoured with a V-shape, so usually more fluvially scoured, very steep terrain. Um, and if it's glacially carved, it's going to start to have more of a U-shaped valley. Type 2 is more of a steep hillside areas. And then type 3 is where you have a valley, but there are many well-dissected, highly sediment-producing um, tributaries to that, which could be producing these, like, what we call these fan shapes or alluvial fans that are protruding onto the valley floor and causing the stream to be forced into different... Um, plan view position. The next set are more incised kinds of valleys. Could be a, a complete gorge, could be a U-shaped glacial valley like you would have in the, the Pacific Northwest where there's a lot of uh, glacial carving, uh, or it could be fault controlled like we have in the coastal range of California where, where you see that kind of condition. Then you start to get to the more lowland, where there's a, a relatively low rates of uplift compared to um, the rates of climate-based incision. And so you can get a highly dissected, 
watershed with relatively, you know, low to moderate relief for the contributing areas to a broad terrace floodplain and a very large river um, and, a, you know, generally been depositional environment over a long period of time. Um, glacial outwash and then, you know, extensive lowland floodplains and, and mud flats or, you know, uh, inorganic flats. And finally, deltas. And we're not going to be talking about deltas here. So this just shows you a variety of valley types. And you can imagine that the processes and streams in these settings could be all quite different. Again, I want to emphasize the topic of degree of bedrock control. Um, and in the upper left, we have an alluvial river. In this case, you can see that the river is making a sharp right, but there's all these signs of bank collapse and you know, the unraveling of this, this river. Um, and so that's typical of an alluvial sitting, the idea that the water can adjust the banks in a relatively short period of time for relatively you know, small floods. Um, the far upper right would be a purely bedrock river there are unique erosional features here, or potholes and flutes and so forth. Um, but overall, where the flow is going is strongly determined by the bedrock, and that can only be changed over long periods of time through fairly aggressive slope-driven processes. And finally, you could have a mixed condition where you do see bedrock outcrops, but you also have alluvial sediment helping define the conditions too. Okay, so now we're going to come down from the catchment scale and valley scale to reaches and geomorphic units. This is the scale at which you tend to see process form associations so that you see a section of a, of a river and you can say, well, I can discern what's causing that. I can see that the landforms that are there are responding to the processes that are driving them at the scale. And I mean, I guess you can do that at any scale, but... Um, this is typically a scale that's more commonly associated with stream assessments because this is often a scale at which humans have had a big influence and where we're trying to manage the system in, an, in a different way. So the reach scale tend to be, uh, if you look at the channel width um, of a river, something like 100 to 1,000 times the channel width would be the length of a reach. And it's just going to depend on what kind of things are going on in, in, a, in a river quarter to know how long that is. Um, could you, you, do you have uh, abrupt slope breaks? Do you have uh, major tributaries coming in that are changing the character of the river? Are there man-made structures? The things like that could influence your decision to stop a reach and start a new one. Uh, geomorphic units, will go into more depth, but they're basically the individual landforms. Just like on a hill slope, we had hollows and noses, well, geomorphic units in a, in, a in a river channel could be a pool, could be a bar, um, could be a glide or a riffle, for example. And so at this scale, this is where we're going to focus our stream assessment. And we're going to focus on measuring that at, in five ways. Cross-sections, longitudinal, plan form, bed material, and bank conditions. Now what we're going to do is characterize, you know, like measure, quantify the conditions. I'm not going to go into the topic of are the values that you quantify representative of good condition or disturbed or impaired conditions. That's the kind of thing that um, is going to just depend on the specifics of an individual setting and is typically covered in, you know, a state or regional level protocol um, you know, that's kind of beyond the scope of this, this course. So when we look at the cross-section of a river, the first thing to understand, if we haven't been exposed to this before, is that rivers, of course, are defined by the geometry of the shape of the channel in cross-section. And most of the time, the water stays well within the geometric shape of the channel, as what we call base flow. But there is a stage that we call the bankful stage, which is shown in this second one, where the water is just filling that geometric shape. Now it isn't always easy to measure the bankful stage and there also are plenty of videos and other guidance about that and we're not going to talk about that here. Um, now we may see the video in class but um, we'll, think, we'll see about that. 
Um, but, but knowing bankful is very, very important. And the reason for that is it denotes the transition from, of course, being in the channel to potentially flooding out onto the land. And that's a level that people have identified as having something to do potentially with why is the channel sized that way anyway? I mean, the river is sized to just carry that amount of flow in its channel. So that says something that there could be a process form relationship. Um, I would say, you know, it hasn't turned out to be as successful as you'd think it would be, but it certainly shows a very strong correlation. The amount of flow or the discharge that defines Bankville Channel and the, the shape of the channel um, and other processes that take place. But it's not as much as I think other people would want you to believe. Then you can have higher flows, and I'm using the subscript 2 here to indicate the discharge that overtops the banks once in two years, you know, 10 for once in 10 years, and 50 for once in 50 years. Um, we, you will be, actually, you've, you should have already seen this notation from the first homework in the class, um, which you might still be completing potentially. Um, and so it's not the exceedance, but it's the return interval. Okay. All right, so now how do you measure a cross-section? Well, the traditional approach, and I have to say traditional, because as I said in the, the geographical positioning lecture, is this is all kind of changed now, but let's just look at it traditionally. So if you want to go out to a cross-section, you take your auto level. Remember, we talked about auto levels for measuring slope in the river for the discharge presentation. So you set up the auto level, you create your horizontal, in addition to that, put a pin in on either bank or refer to a tree if there's some trees there. Uh, and then you need a graduated measuring tape or it could be um, a cable that has like little metal balls or some kind of mark, marks at a specified interval. Typically, you want to have 30 measurements across the channel, but if the, measure, if the channel is relatively uniform, you could have more measurements where there's more change and less where it's relatively flat. In this case, more changes all along the banks and it's relatively flat in the middle. But let's assume for a moment, you know, like you do a uniform measurement uh, of 30 measurements across the channel. Um, then you would, you're basically measuring the shape of this cross section. Don't worry about where the water is at all. It's kind of irrelevant. And as you go across, the person with the auto level just cites off the values on the vertical rod, and, and they either write it down or they call it out to, to you know, somebody who is the, the designated writer. Um, and we'll be doing this in the field, so you'll see how that works. Once you have a cross-section, what are some of the things you can get? Well, for any given stage, you can get the depth and the width. You can estimate the wetted perimeter the cross-sectional area, the hydraulic radius. And then also, if you can successfully identify the boundary between the channel and the floodplain, then you can identify the bankful top width, which we just call the bankful width, um, as well as the bankful depth. And there's some more measurements associated with that. So once we have the bankful stage, if we go to an elevation two times the bankful stage, and we then look at the top width there, then that can be defined as the flood prone area. And we can have that flood prone width and flood prone depth. Then we can define something called the entrenchment ratio, which is the ratio of the floodplain width to the bankful width. Now I hate this definition because a higher entrenchment ratio value means less entrenchment, which is the stupidest idea I've ever heard. Because you think, boy, I've got a really high entrenchment ratio value, I gotta be really entrenched. Let's try to think about what this means. What is entrenched, okay? Entrenched is a very important concept in assessing a river. I wanna know if my river has been cut down disproportionately more than it should. Incised rivers or entrenched rivers are extremely difficult to fix. I would say they're the most enigmatic problem that we have, and it's, it's really a challenge. So knowing whether a river is, is overly incised or entrenched is very important. On the other hand, 
there are many natural rivers that have high entrenchment ratio values. So it's not necessarily an indicator, um, but it could be in the right situation. So now let's just think, imagine a simple U-shape river, I should probably put my face out of there, and um, you know, imagine one that's relatively narrow, okay? Well, if I have a, a low water level and then the water goes up, like a slot canyon, for example, um, it doesn't matter what stage I'm at, I'm gonna have the same width you know, for a flood as for a base flow. So that's a case where you have a very entrenched system which means it has a very low entrenched value because you know, in the limit, the flood prone width and the bankful width could be the same, and so you have a value of one. The entrenchment ratio cannot be any lower than one because, well, I guess it could be. I mean, I guess you could have a, a Erlenmeyer flask shape of a river or something, or Florence flask. I mean, that would be awfully, it would be awfully strange to have a river with a, with a cross section that, like that, um, but it's possible, you know, a, a cave or some sort of pipe or something like that. Um, so on the other hand, you know, it's much more common that you're going to have something like that, and so, or as shown in here, the flood if the flood plain area is very wide and the the bankful width is relatively small, then the entrenchment ratio will be high, which means it's not entrenched. Now, you know. Maybe I just don't know something here, but why would you call something the entrenchment ratio if <laughs> the higher it gets, <laughs> the uh, <laughs> the less entrenched it is? I don't know. Maybe maybe there's some kernel of wisdom from the dark ages here of, of, of geomorphology, and and I, I and, and, but I, I'll get off my soapbox now. Okay, now here's something really really cool, and this is really hard to grasp, but it's so cool, so powerful. So I have to show you. There's something called at-a-station hydraulic geometry. This is the idea that um, we can characterize the shape of the channel and its attributes in terms of roughness and slope by working out the relationships between width, depth, and velocity as a function of discharge. At a station means if I stay at one cross section and I look at how discharge changes through time as flows rise and fall. So if I look at this U-shaped cross, actually let's start with a V. If I start with this V-shaped cross section, this cross section has the characteristic that as the discharge increases, depth and width always remain the same. If if it, you know, because this is a if this is a 90 degree notch, then it has that characteristic. Now what's f and b? Well f and b are the exponents of the width and depth functions as discharge increases because this is a power function relationship and then a, c, and k are the coefficients. Now if I take that, that v and I just bend it, like you know, I'm the man of steel and I bend this steel bar and bend the channel from a v into a u, what I'm doing is I'm saying that as discharge increases then the depth is going to increase much more than the width. On the other hand, if I take that V and I bend it out this way, just bend that out, then I get this convex banks, and now as water rises, the width is going to increase faster than the depth. So simply by knowing the values of B and F, I know what shape of the channel is. To add one more complexity to this, I can add another value of m. m is either a steeper, uh, relates to steeper slopes and roughness. So um, if I have a very steep slope or a really smooth channel, then as discharge increases, velocity is going to increase disproportionately, which means f and b will both be small. And for a rectangular channel, recall that width times depth times velocity equals discharge. So that means that B plus F plus M have to sum to 1. So B, F, and M are all less than 1, usually less than 0.5, and the relative values of those will tell me something about the shape of the channel. So this is very useful for stream assessment because if I put out a stage, uh, stage gauge and I can work out
this relationship, then I can understand a lot about the functioning of the river with that cross section. Okay, well slope measurement, now we're switching to the longitudinal aspects of the river, so that's, that's it for what I want to say about cross section. But the longitudinal aspects, you know, slope is the, the, the big thing to know. Uh, it's important to appreciate though, okay, now remember from Manning's equation and Chessy's equation, slope is the independent variable. But uh, an important concept that's relatively hard to understand is that slope itself is something that changes over decades. And so it, it, that's relatively fast in, in terms of how rivers change. And in fact, slope is the least independent variable in a river when it's an alluvial river. Now the valley slope is, is independent, but the river can adjust its slope. Uh, for example, it can just change its sinuosity, which I'll illustrate in a few moments. But the slope of the river, we've already covered how to do this, so you can refer back to the discharge presentation, but I just want to repeat this slide here um, because it's something that you need to be able to do. Now, before I move on, I'd just like to comment that in terms of measuring a cross-section and measuring the slope, technology is changing. The idea to me of going out with an auto level and just measuring a few cross-section is somewhat abhorrent. And I've already given you um, somewhat of a presentation about the potential for near census environmental science in the experimental design and sampling. Because what I've been doing here, and I guess I just realized it, is I've been showing you an approach to assessing rivers that's based on sampling. Okay, We're sampling at these different spatial scales, like we want to characterize reaches or geomorphic units, but how do we do that? We go out and hit some of them and measure their attributes. But if you rethink this from a near census perspective, you can see that we could go out with LIDAR or multi-beam echo sounder or structure from motion and just get the entire map of the river. And then, if you want to pull out a cross-sectional base analysis, forget all this stuff, basically just go into ArcGIS or AutoCAD or QGIS or whatever you want and just pull out the cross-sections wherever and however you want. Or forget cross-sections and start thinking about ways of assessing the stream as a holistic landform. So those are topics that are a little bit beyond the scope of this class, but in terms of the future directions of what's happening in science, that's the key of where things are going. But it's still always mindful that you want to look at things in terms of cross-section, longitude, totudinal profile, and then the plan view. And so we'll look now at what happens when you look at a river top down? And what you'll see are straight rivers, meandering rivers, and braided rivers. Now I've cheated a little bit because this braided river is in a bedrock setting, but you know it's, it's, just, a, it's just an illustration. And there's also a fourth type called the nastamosing, and there's other ones, but let's just stick with these three big ones. So if we want to look at a single threaded river, uh, not braided river right now, but a single threaded river, a common approach has been to pretend that it, it, its meanderings are like a sine curve and then use the simple physics of waves and oscillations to characterize it. So we can define the wave length as the length from a position you know, along uh, the sine function, basically one apex to the next apex. We can define the amplitude as the length um, between apexes, api, <laughs> okay, we've got the radius of curvature, um, which is pretty obvious, it's this angle, uh, sorry, well, it's the, uh, the radius associated with that, and then there's also this inflection point. Well, it turns out people have measured this for a lot of rivers, and they've come up with some very simple observations, like wavelength tends to equal 11 times channel width, Wavelength tends to equal about five times the radius of curvature, and then the amplitude uh, also tends to be about 11 times the width. I think I will check that, but uh, anyway, that's what I've written down. Okay, so uh, uh, some, something doesn't seem right there, and I apologize for that. But anyway, it, you can check, check that out. I'll check that out and make sure that it's okay. So another thing to be aware of is the concept of sinuosity. When you look at a meandering river, if we follow the center line here, then we can define the length of the stream along that center line. 
and that stream length. However, as we're running down the valley, we can just measure the length from the top of the valley to the bottom of the valley, and that's a much shorter length. And this is what I mean when I say that a river can adjust its slope simply by changing its sinuosity. A more sinuous stream has a lower slope over the same valley length, given that valley slope. Another thing that you can see from looking top down are the landforms within the channel at the spatial scale of a channel width, like 1 to 10 channel widths, or even a little bit less than 1. <coughs> channel units <coughs> are also called geomorphic units or morphological units. There's a variety of names, but the important thing is these refer to the landforms themselves. Sometimes people will map these in what I would call one dimension, which is just how do they change along the length of a stream, assuming that it's the same all the way across. For example, if this gray box was a step in the river, you know, it's possible that that could be across the whole river. On the other hand, if I just duck back a bunch of slides here, you know, here we have a step, and the step is very, you know, very abrupt. It's only over a small part, and then it, it, it sculpts back to this other you know, as, as a giant U-shaped thing. And so here, you know, there's a very short domain over which that's there. It is not horizontal, and there's an immense amount of complexity in a relatively short domain that is meaningful about the shape of the landforms that are present there. And so as a result of that, you can also try to map these either in the field or with different computer-based methods as two-dimensional, you know, planform views as you know, your riffle, pull, run, glide kind of things as being fractional widths of the river. So here's an example of a morphological unit map with each color or stickled or striped area as a different unit type. Uh, and not just in the channel, but also on the floodplain or terraces. And after making a map like this, you could compute the area of each one in the river quarter, and then what's the percent of the total area with the ones that are highlighted here being the most of the in-channel units, which is the top group, then there are the bars, and then there are the, the you know, the, the floodplain and terrace features. At the next scale down, it's possible to look at hydraulic units, which are not landforms, but tend to be more discharge-dependent discharge attributes of a river. So the geomorphic units, they don't change as discharge changes. Hydraulic units do. Hydraulic units um, are not the riffle, but is the pattern of the water over the riffle, and that can change as a function of discharge. But a hydraulic unit is the combination of sediment that's on the riverbed in combination with the depths and velocities that are present there. Could be boulders, could be woody material, or other things that are influencing it and you're looking for a coherent feature. Now, whether that feature is, is uniform or not is debatable. Uh, in, the, in the River Styles Guide further up, if I go back, it, it does say that these should be uniform, and I'm not sure that I would agree to that. You know, uniform patches of flow and substrate. For example, if you have a recirculating eddy, that eddy is a single coherent feature but I wouldn't describe it as uniform from spot to spot. One way to get at hydraulic units is to do something called two-dimensional hydrodynamic modeling. This is where you look at the pattern, well, I mean, you, you put discharge in at the upstream end, you need Manning's end for your domain, and you need the stage at the downstream end, and then it computes the pattern of depth and velocity at the resolution of a computational grid, which could be like one meter resolution or something. And then you can see that there are patches of peak velocities or very low velocities. Like red is high velocity, blue is low velocity, and green is kind of in between. So there are these different areas with these different hydraulic units that are in there. Okay, the next overall attribute of interest for stream assessment is the bed material. A very common approach to characterizing bed material is with the Wentworth size class system. Bed material is often fine. You know, it could be like a clay or silt, sand, some kind of material like that. It could be very, very small. And so here is the size in millimeters or microns of that material. Because it spans over a wide range, it's helpful to use the log 2 scale. 
Log 10 is too big. You know, like log 10 is good for hydraulic conductivity for groundwater movement because it has such a wide range. But the bed material size, it has a fundamental limit. And so if you do a log 2 scale, you're talking about you know, 34 orders of log 2 magnitude. Um, and these are very manageable numbers from negative 20 for the largest down to 14 for the smallest. And then the Wentworth size class is just a qualitative description for a range of particle sizes as to what we're going to call it. Um, we use the term mud to represent all sizes of clay and silt. And then we use sand. That sand goes from 62.5 microns up to 2 millimeters, which, yep, right here. And then from 2 to 32? Let's see. I usually think of, okay, well, so there you go. From two to four is gravel. No, okay, well, they call gravel here uh, quite a big range, I guess. I usually think of it as two to 32 or two to 64. And then, um, you know, cobble, this doesn't have cobble. So this, you know, this size class, yeah, not too detailed over here. But anyway, so, and then once you get above 256, I mean, that's 25.6 centimeters, which is almost like a one foot diameter. That's like basketball sized feature, and so we use the term boulder for that. Okay, so with this size classification system, what you typically want to do is characterize the bed material in two ways. What's on the surface of the bed and what's in the subsurface? How are you going to do this? Also, we need to have a spatial sampling approach. And we're, we also are going to run to the problem. Now we need cross sections, we need to decide, are we going to stratify the landscape, uh, uniform sampling, all, all that stuff that we've already covered, and are you going to use equal effort? So in this case, we're going to locate a reach, okay, and this gives you a sense of like 20 to 30 channel widths in length. <clears throat> Determine the percentage of the reach in riffles and pools, and then put your transects there so that you can, now there's two ways here. Like this says to collect a representative percentage. So the percentage of samples taken in riffles is equal to percent of channel reach as riffles. So that's sampling in proportion to the area. That's one approach. However, when you do that, you may find that you're undersampling areas that you want to characterize. So as I said before in the, in the experimental design presentation, I would not use this approach if you want to have an equal representation of all unit types. If you want to characterize a rare thing, and in environmental science, rare things are very important to us. So if you want to characterize that, you need to use equal effort regardless of percent area. So that I'm, I'm advocating for a different approach here than what is stated here. But there may be times, like if you want to just get the overall aspect of the river, then you have to decide on a way to do that. And sampling in percent of area is one way to do that. Another is to know the area, very accurately use equal effort in each area to get the, the strata representative value, and then simply weight that value by its abundance. That's my preferred approach. So it, it, there's two alternatives here. And I probably lost some of you, so you may want to replay that, but again, the basic idea here is, do you sample with the number of samples proportional to the abundance of something? So I'm gonna, whatever occurs a lot, I'm gonna sample many, many, many times. And things that occur rarely, I, yeah, I might not sample them at all. Or am I gonna sample each type of thing equal effort so that I can really well characterize those and then based on that excellent characterization and the assessment of the uncertainty in that characterization, I can then um, adjust by area to get the correct uh, value. Another thing I want to mention here is this does talk about a pebble count method. And so I haven't talked about the specific methods of sediment characterization because I'm going to be covering that in another presentation. So we, there will be a surface sediment characterization video podcast. And so I'm not going to go into the details of those methods. But I'm trying to focus on what you would do in an overall stream assessment. One of the reasons why we care about sediment, you know, it's hydrology, but sediment is really important, not only because it's 
moving around in unprecedented amounts and we're eroding our land in unprecedented in history. Um, but it's just a fundamental aspect of how rivers change because sediment has to deposit um, or erode to see how those changes take place. And so this is a very simple diagram. It's called Lane, Lane's diagram. Um, and it helps to illustrate the processes of water and sediment movement in a river in relation to channel change. So imagine I have a condition of river such that the river is not eroding or filling in at all. Now, let me add more water. So if, if I fill this picture up and get more water, forget the fish, but just I have more water, then you could imagine that this side of the scale is going to go down. And as that goes down, you see the little swing arm in the middle of the, with the arrow? As that goes down, it's going to tilt this way, and that means it's going to tilt towards degradation. See how that, that's going to change. So more water means more force driven by gravity, which means more scour. If I take the slope, so if I, if I just shift this weight on the right in and out, so if I, if I shift it out, that shifts the weight further out um, on the scale, which means that it has more lever action, so it's going to pull it down. And again, that's going to tilt it towards more degradation. If I push the slope in or I take water away, then it's going to swing back. On the other side is the sediment. If I just put on more sediment, just keep filling the water with more and more sediment, now I'm going to be shifting the pendulum towards aggradation. And um, it's going to be filling in because I've simply got too much load that the water can't carry. If I take the slider and I slide it from coarse to fine, then um, I'm going to be increasing the ability of the river to channel, so it's going to up to, I'm sorry, I'm going to be increasing the ability of the channel of the flow to carry that fine sediment. So it's going to tend to either not erode or fill in, or it's going to swing towards degradation. On the other hand, if I put a lot of big stuff way out there, it's going to be really hard to move, and so now I'm going to shift towards aggradation and fill in again. In the very bottom, QS stands for the discharge of sediment, QW, discharge of water, S is slope, and D50 is the median particle size. So just think about how these scales work. Um, it's a good idea to help you just appreciate the processes of degradation and aggradation in response to the controls of total discharge, total sediment, slope, and sediment size. And if you can understand this diagram, then you can see why a lot of the attributes of the river that I've been talking about measuring are important for stream assessment. Okay, bank addition is the last variable that I want to present for assessment. Um, this is a qualitative assessment of bank condition where you look at the shape and you infer what's happening. So if you have a very high bank relative to water depth, then you have a high risk of being undercut. So that's high risk. Bank angle, if you have, of course, if it's, if it's already oversteepened, there's a high chance of collapse. So that's high risk. And see bank erosion potential on the left, low, moderate, and high. Density of roots, if you have a lot of roots that applies a lot of cohesion, or if you have a root ball that's present there, that could all be holding things together and resisting erosion, so that is helpful. Soil stratification is, is you know, I mean, of course, if, if that stratification provides stronger layers, that's good, but um, if those layers are layers that uh, are highly erodible, then then that weakens it. Now, I don't entirely agree with this particular assumption because, of course, if this is all sand, then having a complete sand bank would be the most erodible. And if you have a sand bank and you add some clay layers into it, it will, it will stabilize it. I mean, think about concrete. We add rebar because it adds a lot of strength um, for it breaking apart. So soil stratification is sort of a mixed bag if, uh, Whatever is there, of course, the weakest layers are always the weak link, and you have to look at that. Particle size matters both in terms of size and a mixture. So if you have a uniform particle size distribution or like a lot of the same size, then it's going to be like marbles, and there'll be a very easy ability to have friction internally and have the whole thing fall apart. 
If you have a lot of angular pieces or a mix of different sizes or even fine material that's cohesive, then that helps to hold the whole thing together. So this is more of a qualitative characterization. Now if you wanted to do a bank condition assessment in a quantitative way, now you can go and hit it with terrestrial LIDAR or you can take repeated photos through time and look at changes through time and um, we can get a very quantitative assessment of the details of how banks change. Okay, so what I've tried to do in this presentation is look at a couple of different spatial scales, think about what's happening at the catchment scale, think about what's happening um, at the scale of a reach as two of the key ones where you're always going to want to present some characterization. We looked at the different kinds of valleys that you might see and I've talked through some of the processes there in terms of tectonic uplift and climate that are controlling that. Also geology would be very important, lithology. But then at the reach scale, being able to look in cross section and longitudinal profile in plan view looking down on the river characterizing the bed and bank material. These are the big ways that we can assess the physical structure of the system. What you do with that information is still, you know, it's not what this class is about, but what we're going to try to do on our field trips is think about these kinds of variables and, you know, even be prepared to measure these and do an assessment, both for the small watershed field trip we're going to have as well as for the, the stream field trip. Okay, so I'll stop there.